I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die Dr. Pascal Lee is a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute, despite today's topic, the SETI Institute, the Mars Institute, and the NASA Ames Research Center. He is internationally recognized for his Mars work in particular, the history of water on the red planet, the origin of Mars' moons, and the future of human exploration of Mars. Pascal earned a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in geology and geophysics from the University of Paris. After coming to the U.S., he earned an astronomy PhD from Cornell University, where he was able to work with Wonderfest inspiration and a personal hero, perhaps to many of us, certainly to me, Carl Sagan. Dr. Lee has led over 30 expeditions to the Arctic, the Antarctic, um, and elsewhere to study Mars by comparison with Earth. Dr. Lee's first book, Mission Mars, won the 2015 Prize for Excellence in Children's Science Books from the American Association for the Advancing of Science. But I have read this book, and it's not just for children, although I imagine the supreme joy might be reading this with a child, because you would learn as much as the child, maybe more, that you enjoy that sense of wonder, which one of us tries to inspire from just the content of the book itself. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pascal Lee. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tucker, for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, thank you, one of the best, fear skeptics. Uh, this talks for you. And uh, the Duro Biotech for Postmaster. So I really appreciate this. Um, and those of you who are in the audience, thank you for coming. I'm sure you have other things to do. So I hope that this will not be a complete waste of your time. <laughs> we I'm going to be speculating tonight. There's no certainty about any of this. N approximately equals to 1, N being the number of advanced civilizations of our galaxy, um, is a number that I'll show might be reasonable, uh, that I find actually surprising and intriguing. Uh, but I'm not going to prove this to you this evening uh, because there's no proof for it yet. And in fact, it's going to be very hard to prove that we weren't the case. And one would have to essentially visit every planet to be sure. So, uh, but it, nevertheless, it's an intriguing idea. Uh, when I was a little boy, I grew up, of course, looking up at the stars. Uh, and uh, like presumably anybody else who had done that before me, I was just really in awe at the multitude of stars. And of course, it was obvious that we were not going to be alone. There had to be life out there, not only that, but life that you know, we could one day communicate with and perhaps even you know, share a spaceship ride. Uh, so I think, I don't know about previous generations, but certainly for, for kids of my generation and the younger ones, the notion of alien life is not alien. It's, it's something we grew up with. And in fact, uh, if you were to claim somehow that you thought that human life was somehow the only intelligence in our galaxy, you would be stopped at that because you would be considered you know, someone narrow-minded. How could this possibly be the case? Uh, and in fact, it's actually fashionable. It's, it's the thing to, to be open to, uh, to, to, to this multitude of alien civilizations in our galaxy. And, and anybody who would claim that that's not the case would sort of have to, to make it. Uh, but let's look at the numbers tonight, and we'll see where we end up. Uh, so but before we jump into the numbers and equations, I'll uh, a disclaimer first. So, <laughs> there are three organizations that I belong to. <clears throat> None of them are uh, backing out of this, nor are they jumping into it. It's something that I'm doing in my own every time, and all misguided opinions on my own. 
um, remind us often of the state that I credit to Arthur C. Clarke. He said that any time you have a good, a new idea or a new concept, there's going to be four stages to people's reaction to it. Stage number one is no, it's not a good idea. It's not going to work. It's impossible. Stage number two, because you're keeping at it, is all right. It's possible, but it's still not a good idea. Stage number three is okay. It's possible. It could work. It's a good idea, and I always knew it. <laughs> Stage number four is yeah. That was my idea. <laughs> so. Tonight, uh, most people do not believe that N equals 1, and I'll see uh, if over time this will gain broader acceptance. Uh, having said that, I'm definitely not the first one to propose this, or so the only ones to believe this. Well, not, not even believing it, but thinking that this might, might have a chance of being true. So let's look at this disease first. Well, we live on this very small planet in the end, Earth. We have a large moon, large compared to the size of our own planet. I mean, it's smaller than the Earth, of course, but it's nevertheless... Now, this diagram uh, is a bit mislabeled. It's not the solar system in its entirety. The solar system now extends far beyond you know, Pluto. There are many other things that I'm not sure here. The asteroids, the Earth asteroids, the number of comets. Uh, also, the distances, <laughs> the, the heliocentric distance, the distance away from the sun is, is sort of accurately shown in terms of the, the sequence. The, the actual distances between these bodies and the sun are not scale, of course. Otherwise, Jupiter would be this whopping ball in the sky, and the sun, of course, as well. Uh, but what is shown to scale are the relative sizes of, of these bodies. So, the Earth, by any stretch is a sort of a modest body in our solar system. The bulk of the mass of our planet is inside Jupiter, and the bulk of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. The sun is the nearest star to the Earth. Uh, it's a giant ball of hydrogen, and at this point a little bit of helium, but mostly hydrogen, and it's burning uh, uh, fusion is core, and it's generating, uh, you know, of course, a lot of energy. Now, uh, the distance between the Earth and the Moon is about 360 to 400,000 kilometers. So if you were to drive to the Moon, that would take you about, so driving at, let's say, the speed limit in California, 70 miles per hour, non-stop, uh, no bathroom breaks. Well, not that you could, but if you drove to the Moon, it would take you five months. Now, at the speed of light, it takes you, well, that would be instantaneous for you if you were the light. But looking at the light, the crossing, uh, it would take one and a half seconds each way. So when the Apollo astronauts were on the moon and Houston was talking to them, Houston would say something, and a second and a half later, they would hear it, he would talk back. It was like sort of a good old fashioned satellite link. It was a bit of delay, but nothing that prevented essentially long night interactions. So the moon is 1.5 light seconds away. And the speed of light is considerable. It's 186,000 miles per second, 300,000 kilometers per second. In fact. Now the sun, if you are thinking in terms of the speed of light, is 8 light minutes away. If the sun were to shut down, not that there's any reason, not that there's any reason that it would, but if it were to shut down, you would not know about it uh, for another 8 minutes. Uh, Pluto, in this picture, is five light hours out from the Sun, uh, the Earth, basically, with the eight minutes. So the difference, five light hours, that's, that's, that's getting into The nearest star beyond the Sun to us is actually a triple star system. It's called Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri has three components, Alpha Centauri A and B, which are two suns that are roughly the size of our own sun, two stars that are roughly the size of our own sun, that are in orbit around each other, more or less. And then there's a third component that's much dimmer called Proxima Centauri. <coughs> that component that's the closest to us, it's right now at about 4.26 light years away. So, 
proximus centauri, it's not even clear that it's actually part of the system or it just happens to be passing by alpha centauri A and B. We're not quite sure that it's in orbit around the system, but anyway. Proxima Centauri was recently found to have a, um, a close to Earth sized planet in its habitable zone. So it's very exciting. Here we have the nearest star to our own planet, and sure enough, it has something that is in its habitable zone. Uh, Alpha Centauri A and B have not yielded planets yet. Everybody's looking, and that's going to be uh, a big piece of news if, if anything is found. But anyway, the sense though is that. Even if you are looking at how fast light does the trip, it will take 4.3 4 4 years uh, to get there. Now, all the stars that you see in our night sky that are not, all these little points of light that are not stars, and that are not planets or more distant galaxies, are stars that are within our own galaxy. Our galaxy is a gigantic swarm of stars, and I'm going to show you here. Uh, one of the closest galaxies that's roughly of the same size as ours um, in our neighborhood, this is the Andromeda Galaxy. Andromeda is about 2 million light years away. So this picture is showing you not the way Andromeda is quite now, but <laughs> the way it was 2 million years ago. Humans were barely emerging. Uh, and uh, our galaxy is sort of like this, although I think our galaxy has some more distinct spiral arms than, than the ones that, that uh, are here in Andromeda. But they're roughly the same size. This is a swarm of about a hundred billion stars. The diameter of Andromeda and of the Milky Way galaxy, which is the name of our own galaxy, our own galaxy has a name as well, it's called Milky Way. The Milky Way galaxy has a diameter of about 100,000 light years. So when we're looking at the stars at the, other, at the other end of the galaxy, looking at them the way they were 100,000 years ago. Okay. Now, uh, notice that in addition to stars, which is what makes up this sort of fuzziness with the overall structure, individual stars, there's no, that's essentially what's generating this, this fuzzy image. Uh, there are bands of cloud, dark dust clouds that are swirling around the center of the galaxy as well. You can see the dark bands. And I point this out because we, with our sun, are embedded in one of the spiral arms of our own galaxy. And so we do not see directly, in, in clear view, the central bulge of our galaxy where we have the bulk of the stars in our galaxy. We are sight towards the center of our galaxy is obscured by some of these bands of dust. Uh, the other thing that's, that's worth pointing out is that, let's say this were the Milky Way galaxy, well the sun, uh, well first of all, we're going around the sun, we're hurtling around the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. So since this part began, we've been around you know, quite a bit. Uh, and then, uh, the sun itself is traveling at 200 and 20 or so kilometers per second around the center of our galaxy. And the sun takes about 225 million years to go one full circle around our galaxy. So, but when the dinosaurs were still roaming, because they became extinct only 65 million years ago, the last time we were roughly where we are here in our galaxy, on turn and go, dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. Uh, this was a wild place. So things change in time. Uh, anyway, uh, this is one of the most beautiful galaxies you can see uh, in our night skies. This is one of the closest ones to us. Uh, this is what our military looks like. When you don't have a very good camera, but you are in a place that's an incredibly clear skies. This is when I went over it in Antarctica, uh, something like 30 years ago. So I was a young man. I, it's very lucky. I spent a year at the uh, French station and uh, just turn on your camera with a long exposure and look up into the sky. We do not see the center of our galaxy from the northern hemisphere, but when we're in the southern hemisphere, the whole solar system is tilted in such a way that you can look towards the center of our galaxy. And that's what that huge cloud of brightness is. That's the central bulge of our galaxy. 
And all the dark clouds that you see in the foreground are just these dust bands that are inside the Milky Way. And of course, all these motion uncompensated streaks are essentially stars in our own galaxy in the foreground, closer to us. Anyway, uh, one can see the Milky Way, and it's called the Milky Way, maybe obviously here because it looks like essentially milk getting poured uh, across the sky. And uh, in the Greek, uh, don't use the word milk, they use the word galactos, which I guess will give you a sense of where the galaxy comes from. It was not invented by science. <laughs> so this is this is the central bowel of our galaxy, the center of our galaxy. This is where we're embedded, and so we are we're really in the middle of the action. And uh, again, our Milky Way has about a hundred billion stars. So shouldn't there be some other alien civilization out there that we could communicate with? Beyond our galaxy. And Andromeda, the universe is full of galaxies. They're not completely uniformly distributed, there are strands and filaments of galaxies. But basically, if you add up the numbers, in this in this field of view here, this is a Hubble Space Telescope deep field camera view of some corner of the universe. Uh, there are a few foreground stars that are part of our galaxy, but otherwise, every one of these little ovals is an entire galaxy. Each one, roughly, rich uh, of a hundred billion stars or so. Each one, roughly, a hundred thousand light years across the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you add it all up, we figure that there is about a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. So it's not just the ovals; it's the dots too. Right? It's the dots too. Right. Exactly. Some are spherical galaxies. Some of these dots are just foreground stars. I mentioned earlier, but most of these things are galaxies. It's astounding. And so, let's do some math. The number of galaxies in the universe, roughly 10 to the power of 11, that's 100 billion. Okay, that's a 1 followed by 11 zeros. The number of stars per galaxy, rough average. Astronomers reason in terms of orders of magnitude. So, you know, if you're within the factor of 10 or 100, you're close enough. Uh, number of stars per galaxy about 100 million. Another one followed by 11 zeros. And let's say now that we are realizing that planets are common, you know, and of course by planets you can be generous, you can call larger asteroids planets too, or dwarf planets, anyway, planetary bodies. Uh, it's not a stretch really to imagine that roughly you know, there, there could be 10 or more planets per star at this point. So it's an average number uh, in the universe. So how many planets does that make? In the universe, 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 11 times 10, that's 10 to the 23 planets in the universe. That's a 1 followed by 23 zeros. That's 100 billion trillion stars. Now, urban legend suggests that that's more sand grains than are contained all the beaches of the earth together. Together. Yeah. How do we know that why is there an upper limit to the number of galaxies in the universe? How do we know it's that? Um, it's, it's not really a rigid limit, it's it's as far as we can count them. And of course you have to realize that the galaxy that we're now seeing, the farthest galaxies we know of are roughly 13 and a half billion light years away. Which beyond that we don't see any galaxies that are showing more red shape, or it's more Existence. And, and that, by the same token, defines the age of the universe 13 and a half billion years old. Uh, but bear in mind that the Sun and the solar system formed about you know, four and a half billion years ago, so you know, the universe, we're, we're, the planet is half as old as the universe. Uh, the initial sentence there is just for those of you who are chemists. I <laughs> do not appreciate the humor, but anyway, 10 to the power of 23 is very close to the other gathering here. So, you could summarize that as being one mole of planets. <laughs> and that's within the order of magnitude. Now, let's 
Coming back to our own galaxy, the uh, number of planets in our galaxy, well, we just get rid of the, all the other galaxies. And, uh, it's just 10 to the power 11 times 10. That's a 1 followed by 12 zeros. That's a trillion planets, assuming an average of about 10 per star. A trillion planets in our galaxy. Now, a trillion is a staggering number. Uh, it's still only 19 times less than the national debt. <laughs> okay, so, so of course we have this vision of the galaxy um, where, you know, a, mul a multitude of races and peoples, um, we get to encounter them in CD bars, <laughs> in the corners of the galaxy. Some of them are diplomats, some are just musicians, <laughs> living, right? some are scientists, some are pointed ears, some are no ears. All right. But the thing about this is, is the cultural, I'm trying this just to, to convey the fact that it's really deeply rooted in us, this, this cultural acceptance. Of the, of the notion that we're not alone in the galaxy. Okay. And it's very hard to figure out where it comes from. It could be the, from the fact that, you know, in America, for example, we, we live in the, the melting pot, and so sort of the transposition of our culture and experience with stars. Uh, it's also the fact that um, we actually don't like to feel lonely. You know, maybe we maybe conjure up friends that don't actually exist. <laughs> So, a lot of, all of us in the see see some therapy. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are comfortable with this notion that we're not alone. And in fact, there's, a, there's, there's unstated acceptance that there are many civilizations out there. So, and then comes the Drake equation. So, Frank Drake is a, an American scientist. He actually was once a professor at Cornell. By the time I got there, he had moved on, came to the Bay Area, and founded the SETI Institute, which still exists. Uh, Frank is uh, still around, he lives in the uh, Aptos in Santa Cruz. And Frank, uh, back in the 60s, organized one day a, he's a radio astronomer, so he studies the universe by pointing radio dishes at the universe, listening to the radio noise that's coming from stars and galactic sources or extra galactic sources. Anyway, Frank, like with Carl Sagan and a few others, wondered in the early 60s whether or not we were alone and whether or not radio astronomy could be used to detect signals from the alien civilizations. So that was a very exciting idea. And of course, it meant with a lot of pushback from the you know, uh, traditional uh, astronomers. But nevertheless, Frank organized this conference around the key factors that he thought would matter in determining how many alien civilizations there might be out there for us to listen to. So he figured that we should have a section at this meeting, this workshop, that would focus on uh, how many stars there are and how frequently they form. Another section focused on how do planets form around stars? Should we expect every star to have a planet? And then another session with mostly biologists uh, who would tell us, well, within a bunch of systems, what would constitute a place that's sustained, that could sustain life? Uh, and then another session that would focus on, okay, let's say you have planets with conditions that can sustain life. Uh, does life automatically appear? What are the conditions that are really required for life, not just to be sustained, but to actually appear? And then another session that would focus on evolution. Uh, okay, you have life on a planet, but what are the conditions that allow life to become, at some point, intelligent? Of course, intelligent has to be defined. We'll get to that in a bit. And then, once you have intelligent life, uh, it's still not communicating when using radio telescopes. Uh, how long does that take for you to get to the point where you have a civilization that's capable of interstellar communication? And then finally, how long do civilizations last? Let's say that they never die. Well, the sky should be full of them. 
So this factor was very important. How long does a civilization last? And that was a, a separate session as well as this workshop. In, in, in that, that discussion, you switched from numbers to time. Yeah. So these are numbers. Very good. This is a time. But this is a rate. This is a number per time. So number per time times the time you cancel out the time. And you're left with just numbers. Good point. So how does one so how do you transform that into numbers? Well let's go over this. So N is the number of advanced civilization. And by advanced we mean uh, capable of interstellar communication. It's important to emphasize that we're talking about the capability, not necessarily that they embrace the practice of interstellar communication. They're just smart enough to do it, should they choose to. They might not decide to just listen. <laughs> uh, so the point about this is, is not to somehow say that, well, we have to assume that they invent the same radio telescope as the one we have. That's not the point. The point here is just to say that we're talking about civilizations that are have reached a point where they are really technologically as capable as we are, if not more. That's what this n number means. All right. So, what are these terms? The rate of star formation in our galaxy. It's the number of stars per year times the fraction of stars that have planets. Because not all stars necessarily would have planets. Times the number of environments that are suitable for life within a given planetary system. Times, and, and once they are suitable for life, these environments, do they actually have life? It may be only a fraction of the world, so times the fraction of those planets that are suitable for life on which life actually emerges. emerges times the fraction of those planets on which life becomes intelligent, find that in bit, times the fraction of those planets on which intelligent life becomes an advanced civilization, and again that means capable of interstellar communication, times the average longevity of the advanced civilization. If you knew the exact value of each one of these terms, you would have a number of advanced civilizations in our galaxy. And this is the beauty of the equation, it's mathematically robust. There are some things that you have to do to them, to it, to adjust for the fact that maybe you would have a civilization that actually conquers a bunch of other planets that were not habitable in the first place, the complexity, but basically uh, it won't change really the order of magnitude of them. Conceivably, it's, uh, the, the equation is, is beautiful in that regard. It's simple. It's just the multiplication of seven factors. If you somehow knew the value of each one of these seven factors, you would get the number in. And of course, and unfortunately, we don't know the value of most of these factors. <laughs> okay. Now, before I move on, and this is sort of the last time you'll see, or maybe not, but this is not a math talk, it's just you know, it's a straightforward multiplication thing. Even if you fail math, um, at an early stage of your life, you really ought to be able to capture the, the operation. But I want to point out a few things. These F terms. These F terms, fraction of stars that have planets around them, Fraction of planets that are environmentally suitable for life or life action emerges. Fraction of those planets that have life where it actually becomes intelligent times the one that actually becomes communicating spiders. These F terms are numbers between zero and one. In other words, in the best case scenario, F does nothing to M to N. It just multiplies the previous terms by the one. <clears throat> Multiplicity by one, math mm -hmm. one, it's that same number. Okay. <laughs> Don't do anything to it. So these F terms can only be bad news <laughs> because at best they do nothing for you to, to pump up N. 
On the other hand, it can be really low, and if you multiply even a series of big numbers by one that happens to be close to zero, well, you are, as they say, best. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's really important uh, that we figure out what these F numbers are, and hopefully they are not, none of them is really a very small number. Uh, lately, as you know, we found a lot of planets around stars. And so there's a lot of enthusiasm because, hey, wow, F sub P, you know, I mean, somehow the thinking is this is really going to boost our chances for finding alien civilizations. Mm -hmm. yeah, the truth thing is, in the best case scenario, it just tells us that F sub P might be close to 1, or 1, with all stars and planets. And, well, all it does is, that's not going to be the term that will destroy your chances. That's what it does. Okay. So, before we go into what we're going to find, here are some historically interesting numbers. If you were extremely optimistic, you use the highest rate of star formation known, 50, you put all these numbers at 1, here, what you're saying in this case is that every planetary system must have at least one planet that's environmental suitable for life. Okay. You know, I think all ten, but at least one. And then the longevity of a civilization, you're saying, well, a million years. Okay. Why a million? Well, that's because it, it starts to get into logical in terms of time scale. You're, you're beyond, you know, a few hundred years, a few thousand years, a million years. It's, it's cool. Okay. Well, if that were true, uh, we'd have in our own galaxy 50 million societies that are capable of interstellar communication. That means the average distance between two, any given two, is roughly 10 light years. There's only so many stars that are that close to us and we're listening, but so far, there's no clear sign that any of them has uh, an advanced civilization. A more standard approach is to use a lower number for the rate of star formation to say that a civilization on average lasts 5,000 years, but to essentially maximize the number of F all along every man. And then you get to 10,000 civilizations in our galaxy. This is commonly used uh, to, as a hypothesis for, for our search for expressive signals, for example with this as a context for it. And nearest civilization might be about a thousand light years away. We're at the point, especially with laser SETI, where we can send signals and uh, presumably capture lasers that are pointed at us that would be emitted from you know, a few thousand light years out. And remember, the entire Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Okay, so a thousand light years, that's you know, not too far from where you are. From one spiral arm to the next, uh, you know, roughly. Okay. So tonight we're going to fill in these blanks. <clears throat> and before we jump into this, one more thing: something called the Fermi paradox, named after Enrico Fermi, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, a great Italian-American physicist, um, was both a, a genius in terms of not just theoretical physics but also practical lab physics. He's the first uh, physicist to build a nuclear reactor. Okay. He's called atomic energy a reactor. He did another one of the things. He also coined the word neutrino. So, anyway, all around right guy. And he left us also with this famous question, which I paraphrase If N is large, so in other words, if there are so many civilizations out there, where's everyone? How come we don't see them more obviously? That's called the Fermi paradox. It's a paradox, the contrast between the idea that n would be a large number and the fact that we see no one. Yeah, sorry. But there's something basic that I think I'm not understanding about the equation. You talk about the rate of star formation, but nowhere in there is anything about the number of the stars. Uh -huh. So, I mean, yeah. that's because, I'll get to it in a second, but the rate of star formation has embedded in it the scale of our galaxy. If our galaxy actually 
experiences about 20 star births per year on average. Well, that's the case because our galaxy happens to be of a certain size. If we were in a smaller galaxy, the rate of star formation would be low. So the size of the galaxy is actually captured and embedded in that term, in that number. If we just had a large number of stars and no new stars were forming, there'd still be some stars to choose from. But that's that's an argument, uh, but <coughs> the thing about this is that, uh, and I did mention this, there are variants of the Drake equation as well. Okay, so this is sort of the classical form of the Drake equation. Uh, there are many variants. Carl Sagan told for one, uh, preferred one where instead of the rate of star formation, it started simply with the number of stars in the galaxy. And then L, at that point, is no longer a time. It's a fraction of, of your planet's life uh, during which you had your advanced civilization uh, living on it. Anyway, uh, you raise a good point, okay, that this is all about the dimensional so if you would set a bunch of those numbers to one, we, we know basically how many stars are in a galaxy. We could check that rate. We could compute that. The rate is known. R is known from observation. Yeah. Um, I'll get to it. <laughs> so the Fermi paradox, where's everybody? And here are a number of classical explanations, okay? So the argument is basically, well, these are almost excuses, in other words, uh, there are actually many, is what, what these answers imply. And there's actually, and there's a large number, there are actually many, it just appears small, there appears to be no body. And that's sort of the uh, common interpretation. Interstellar communication and travel are just very difficult. And so, even though there are plenty of civilizations out there, because communications and distances so long are so difficult, uh, nobody's doing it. So, the interpretation here is that there are, all, there are many out there in civilization, but it's not worth pursuing. Nobody's wasting their time communicating with others. Interstellar communication civilizations are too alien. They are actually sending signals, but we detect them as noise because they're coded, you can't involve them. It's lost in translation, sort of what they're saying. Interstellar civilizations are too advanced or too busy. We we mean nothing to them, they have other fish to fry. <laughs> Interstellar civilizations are not radio loud for all. This is an interesting one. Uh, you know, if you use radio communications and uh, at some point you switch to laser. Okay. Here I say okay, they all switch to cable. So, <laughs> they no longer use radio. Uh, so all of a sudden they become silent, even though they're actually more advanced than than uh, they have radio. Uh, they're actually avoiding us. This is the best proof they're telling. <laughs> Carl Sagan actually is credited for that. Wrote, all right. Um, uh, interstellar community civilizations are greeting us. So they're someone's ant colony. They are protecting us, so they're following the prime directive. They can communicate, it is bypassing us, they're creating a Giving us the impression we are we are alone. <coughs> they are studying us. We're someone's science project. Okay. They are training us. <coughs> like in a farm. Okay. We're not worthy yet. We're not potty trained yet. But at some point on day we'll become the join the club. That's sort of the argument. Uh, you said you can't agree on what to do. They too have a Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Not allowed to communicate somehow, maybe. Uh, they are here, but unseen. They're amongst us. So we're in a lot more trouble than we think. <laughs> uh, this is actually a serious argument that is often uh, used to explain why we haven't detected anything yet. The SETI effort is young, we've only just started. We've only started scanning the skies around us, and only starting recent years to do it over multiple frequencies in a way that's really efficient. So we've just got started. Yeah. One more question. When when will we be able to send us the interstellar communication? We've sent uh, messages. How long ago? In the sixties, Project Osmo, for example, so there was an effort to, to send uh, signals to messages as people are there. So we back to that is the equation that like could be the last one and a half million years. Yeah, so you bring up a good point because 
first of all, I think what happened was it, it's not so much that we got cold feet and stopped transmitting, stopped broadcasting. It's just that it costs actually quite a bit to, to broadcast, and it's a lot more efficient and cheaper to, to just to just scan and listen. And the, the thinking is, well, you know, you should before you make yourself loudly you known to people out there, you should really get a sense of you know what the traffic is. In fact, when you when you fly into this airport, you know, you're on the radio. Uh, you are taught not to just pick up the radio and talk to the control tower. You're supposed to listen in to the traffic over a while to get a sense of, you know, the traffic pattern. You know, and then chime in. So, so you're saying you're not the number one in listening for you know, five billion years, you know, four and a half billion years, fraction of time that we had to map with another civilization that's on our communication stuff. So oh, yeah. It's a big, it's a big, you know, Okay, SETI is misguided. We're not doing the search right. Okay. And then, also, the other thing is actually, we know the number is large, it just appears small because SETI is suppressing, suppressing evidence. Okay, <laughs> here, here. Right. this space intentionally left blank. <laughs> okay, no comment. That's not the reason. So, uh, why why don't we see more civilizations if there are so many of them? So let's look at the rate of star formation. Uh, these I have a few pretty pictures of just Hubble Space Telescope views of stellar nurse, nursery. These are giant clouds of mostly hydrogen, a bit of dust uh, throughout our galaxy. They're lit by stars that have just turned on. And uh, stars are still surrounded by these. Immense clouds of gas and dust, some of which are several light years across. Uh, and uh, these are stellar nurseries. So, even as we speak, the star is still being born. And the rate of star formation in our galaxy has, is understood to be relatively stable. You know, this from theoretical modeling and also just from observations. Uh, they're re relatively randomly uh, spread out. Uh, and uh, the rate of star formation is actually, at this point, relatively well known for our galaxy and the number is about between 20 and 50. So for our substar is probably the least controversial number because we actually have data on this for the decades we've been accumulating data. Uh, the rate of star formation in our galaxy is about 20, maybe double that. You can keep the doubling at the back of your head uh, for now as a compensating factor. But the rate of star formation is about 20 stars per year in our galaxy. And is it nice as it is, we mentioned the galaxy is homogenous enough, so if I ask, what was the rate of star formation in the nearest uh, thousand years? It would be only one of the general It would be similar, yeah. It would be essentially that. And the other thing is, through time, through time it has been that rate as well. Right. Uh, because we see different galaxies in different stages of evolution, right. star formation are, are you know, not bigger than or measure than they are. The fraction of stars with planets. Okay, wow. uh, for a while, before we started finding planets that are nearby stars, we thought the number could potentially be very low. But we have meteorites that allow us to understand how our own solar system formed. We have done a lot of theoretical modeling to understand star-forming regions and planet-forming regions uh, in our galaxy. Even though we could see the planets individually, we understood that some of these stars are surrounded by a disk, fast-rotating disk with debris made of gas and dust, which is how models predict the whole solar system, the planetary systems in general form. Of course, it doesn't just stay dust and gas. At some point, dust grains uh, accrete, stick to one another. Uh, and then they grow in size, eventually planetesimal, small planets are uh, formed, and then eventually small planets collide into one another and creep further into their own planets out of this, this uh, milestone. And so the process of planet formation now is not fully understood, but uh, we understand that it ought to be a common process. There's nothing unique about the solar system in that regard. I mean, there are just Characteristics of our solar system, but uh, there's a wide range of possibilities. And what has really changed, or at least further confirmed that 
planets ought to be common is the direct observation now of planets in our own galaxy. So this is a nice diagram that shows you where we are. Uh, and of course, I want to take the opportunity here to point out that throughout history, the history of astronomy, it, it has all been about sort of pulling us away from being at the center of the universe and putting us in the right place in the big picture. Okay? So we thought, the Greeks thought, for example, that you know, the Earth was fixed and everything else revolved around us. And eventually Copernicus came around, Copernican Revolution, and he demonstrated, well that was an unpopular view at first, mm -hmm. uh, that we were actually all going around the sun, the sun was the center of everything. And then eventually we realized the sun is just one, and that's really humbling, about a hundred billion stars <laughs> going around the Milky Way galaxy. We're not even at the center of our galaxy, we're in one of the spiral arms. To make things worse, we are in the armpit. So, anyway, going back to the Kepler spacecraft, we launched a Kepler spacecraft uh, a few years ago. Uh, Bill Baruki in the Bay Area is the PI, the principal investigator. He proposed the mission, I think, something like six times to NASA. It's declined every time. Or it's on the opposite clock thing, where, yeah, no, it's not possible, it's not going to work. So, and eventually, yeah. Okay. Anyway, Bill Baruki is uh, one of our heroes, and uh, he lives in the Bay So, the Kepler spacecraft just focuses its sight on the Orion Spur, which is a local branch of our arm okay, to maximize the number of stars we can see. And it, it's been looking out to about 3,000 light years. To date, it has discovered, confirmed, these are confirmed discoveries, as opposed to uh, one that are still being checked, uh, about a thousand exoplanets, a thousand planets around other stars. It's a remarkable achievement for this one mission. And the way Kepler works, is that it looks at stars and it's of course looking for planetary systems and planets going around those stars. And it's looking for the dimming of the star when the planet happens to pass in front of the distant star. So this is, imagine you are the Kepler Space Telescope. You're looking at this star. It has a planet around it in this case. Here you don't see any dimming of the star because the planet is not in front of the star. And then the planet encroaches, it's sort of a partial eclipse, if you will, of that star by that planet. So the light from the star starts to dim. And then as the planet transits in front of the face of the star, there's that much loss of luminosity from the star. And then when the planet transits out, the luminosity of the star climbs back up to its normal amount. So, first of all, you have to imagine that this dip is minute compared to the brightness of the star. So, you're looking at an instrument that's incredibly sensitive in terms of being able to detect a slight dim of something that's super bright and blinding, actually. And the other thing, of course, is that this only works if you happen to be looking at that planetary system at all. What if, you know, you're looking at the south pole of that star? Or no poles, just sideways, the planets could be passing and you would never see a dimming. Well, that's taken into account. We only expect so many stars in that field of view to be seen roughly edge on. That can be computed, it's a random thing. And as it turns out, almost every star that we're seeing edge on, we're seeing planets crossing its disk. So, what that tells you really is that. Planets are common, and stars without planets would be really exceptional. How can you tell a star is age on if not for the planets? Excuse me? How can you tell a star is age on if not for the planets? You could not. You could not. So when you don't see the dimming of a star, it's either because it doesn't have planets, or you're just looking at the planetary system not at all. But you just made the statement that but you can. That every star we see edge on, we see planets. Right, because we know that we're seeing these stars edge on because statistically we know how many stars we should expect to be seeing edge on. Oh, I see. So, so what is this fraction of stars? Well, 
it could be one, although you have to be careful. If you, remember, you don't just see this one cone along the Orion spur of our galaxy. And even though we're seeing all stars, all planets around these stars, and pretty much every star seen edge on, we seem to be seeing planets around it. Uh, I think, just out of prudence, we're not going to say F sub t is equal to 1. We're going to say it's just half that. Okay. And it doesn't change the order of magnitude, so, you know, but at the same time, it sort of adds this cautionary factor that, look, we, have, we haven't seen the vast majority of stars around in the galaxy yet. And so, so even though planets are clearly common where we're looking, let's try to give this some more time before we can generalize them. For now, let's go with F, F sub people 50%. Uh, as opposed to what it was before, 5%. This was some people thought that planets would be rare. I think we're out of that concern now, but we're still shy from claiming that every star has planets. So 50% is what I will submit to you as being, you know, uh, cautionary ballpark moving forward. Among planetary systems, how many planets would have an environment that's suitable for life? And by that we mean how many planets would have liquid water at their surface? Well, uh, Tucker mentioned that uh, Natalia Battaglia would be talking about uh, Goldilocks zone. This is sort of an illustration of that. These are stars of different sizes. And brightness, and this band represents for each star size the region, the distance over which, if you had a planet there, liquid water could continually be stable at the surface of that planet. It means that the temperature from that star would not be either too hot or too cold, and with, with or without the help of an atmosphere, which explains these different bands, these different uh, colored bands. Uh, you would be able to have liquid water on the surface. And so, our sun, which is a relatively decent sized average star, which is shown here with the solar system, Mercury's at this distance, Venus, Earth, Mars. You can see that Venus is outside of the Goldilocks zone, barely, but it's actually too hot to have liquid water on it. Mars is pretty much right there in the border, too. It's a little too cold to have liquid water at the surface if the water is just pure water. Uh, and then, of course, places like Jupiter and Saturn, from the Goldilocks region standpoint, are farther, much farther out, and too cold at their the top of their clouds, at least, mm -hmm. to, to be good hosts to to be able to have water. But other stars that are smaller than the sun, dimmer as well, are now known to have planetary system, like uh, Gliese 581 and it has two planets. Gliese 667 has one planet in the Goldilocks zone. They have other planets on these guys, but they're outside of the Goldilocks uh, zone. Kepler 62 has two planets, one of which is uh, super Earth. It's quite a bit bigger than the Earth, but it's uh, a place where the environment would be apparently similar to what we have as well here. So, anyway, this is the habitable zone concept, which means that even if a planetary a star has a planetary system, not all planets will, will be able to sustain life at its surface and with the right temperature condition. And that's based on the distance from that star, depending on the size of the star. Making any assumptions about atmosphere or Sure, sure. Again, that's why you have these different colored bands, with okay. or without atmosphere. So, we move on here because we can't stick it. Uh, Mars, uh, we know today is uh, you know, too cold to have a lot of water on the surface. Uh, but nevertheless, we you know we're seeing, which recently discovered last September, uh, liquid water flow, at least it seems to be the most likely explanation. And that's because the water is not just pure water, because if it were, it would just freeze. The average temperature on Mars is minus uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so minus 60 degrees C. Uh, for liquid water to be possible, the water has to be uh, full of salt, and not just table salt. We now know it's perchlorates. The chlorates in sufficient concentration in water will depress the freezing point of water to about minus 70 C. Okay, so uh, this is not something you want to drink, but it's, uh, it's nevertheless liquid. And there isn't a lot of it, but some of it is there. Now, we've also landed in seven locations on Mars. I'm just showing you the first landing site. Uh, the surface of Mars itself, otherwise, doesn't present any large extent of stable liquid water. It's a pretty harsh surface environment. 
So from the only long zone standpoint, it's sort of a really at the end of things, it's an extreme advantage. But <clears throat> we should expand, and we do in the study, the same research we do, we should expand this notion of habitability beyond this heliocentric or solar distance concept. There's also what happens inside a planet. So we're going to visit Mars and also Jupiter and Saturn. So inside Mars, we know that if you go deep enough, the temperature will rise, just like it rises when you go down to a mine on the Earth. And at a depth of about two to five kilometers, depending on where you are, you are expected to encounter liquid water, temperatures that are warm enough for liquid water to be liquid uh, inside the planet. <coughs> we know that there's plenty of water on Mars to be had, so the, uh, the availability of water is not the issue. It's just too cold right now at the surface, mostly ice. If you go deep enough, you would encounter aquifers with liquid water, so the deep underground of Mars is a very promising place for search for life. There's also hot spots on Mars, places that might be at depth but less deep. Uh, because there's a thermal anomaly in the crust of Mars in those locations, and those are marked by volcanoes. This is a uh, an overexposed view of, uh, of Olympus Mons on Mars. It's the largest, it's one of the largest volcanoes on Mars, it's the tallest mountain in the solar system. And here you have Mount Everest, and this little triangle, <laughs> compared to Olympus Mons is this gigantic uh, shield volcano. Okay, so Olympus Mons, to, to be so big, must have been active for uh, much of Mars' history. Chances are it is still active, it's just not erupting. It might be just dormant. <coughs> so it would be spectacular if Olympus Mons woke up. In any case, uh, you might have to go less deep by drilling or even venturing into a lava tube inside Olympus Mons to find liquid water that's stable. So there are environments that are escaping from this narrow concept of the gold rocks level, where you might have environments that are able to sustain life on planets. On Jupiter, Jupiter is this massive planet. It has many moons, including Europa, that's so shown on the upper right. Uh, Carl Sagan and Edwin Saltpeter had proposed that the atmosphere of Jupiter might actually have life, because there are clouds and water and uh, ammonia gases that could be used as nutrients. And so he speculated that you could have life forms that would take the form of floaters. So these giant gas bags that would inflate and rise, a bit like jellyfish, into the atmosphere, and then we got our radio to sink into the column of organic clouds and metabolize. Of course, this is pure speculation. Uh, nevertheless, it's intriguing. But again, it extends your. It ex it expands your notion of Goldilocks zone to places that are well beyond the sort of warm belt around the star. Uh, Europa, the, one of the large moons of Jupiter, has an icy crust, but its interior seems to be warmed up by tidal friction. And it's, as it moves around Jupiter, it sort of would like to move it in a nice circular orbit, but it's sort of pulled into different directions by these other moons. So there are tides inside Europa that actually are frictional tides that are warming up the inside of the planet. And so the, what, what is happening in Europa is that it now has a crust of ice that's about uh, a few kilometers thick, maybe up to 20 kilometers thick. And then you know that an ocean that's about 100 kilometers deep. So we have oceans that are, the Mariana Trench is 11 kilometers deep. Okay. This is an ocean that's a hundred kilometers deep. Who knows what's living in there underneath the ice crust? So it's, a, it's an ocean at the scale of a planetary body here. The is about the size of our moon. So this is a cross section of the 20 kilometers of the moon crust, and then the ocean beneath. There are plans to set a probe there that would somehow take advantage of a crack. In the crust of Europa, and we explore his uh, studies, some of the water that's coming out through the cracks. Maybe we'll find some of the organic material. Uh, so, again, what we're doing here is exploring this concept that even outside of the Goldilocks zone around the star, there could be environments that are suitable for life where liquid water is present and could sustain life. Another moon of Jupiter that could have a subsurface water. Underneath the surface that is getting 
And then this is one of my, we're jumping on to Saturn now. This is one of my favorite, you can see the images of Saturn. This is not a artificial image, it's, a, it's an actual real image. Uh, they show you the section of the rings of Saturn, uh, the Titan looming in the background. This is the largest moon of Saturn that has an atmosphere, two bars of nitrogen, uh, pink orange clouds, due to organics in the background. And then in the foreground, we have Enceladus, a 200 kilometer or 300 mile wide little icy moon. Now, Enceladus is spectacular. Like your real it has a crust of ice, but now we think that this crust is relatively thin, maybe no more than about 10, 5 or 10 kilometers. And sure enough, some Cassini has been able to do some road passes if you will by Enceladus. And what you see here are jets of water that are, that's gushing out through some of the cracks in the crust of Enceladus. So, there are mission concepts that are, for example, proposing to just have a space plane fly through these plumes of, of uh, ice poles, ice droplets, uh, and sample them and study whether or not they are they contain organic material. And again, this is leading us to think that there is an ocean underneath the crust of Enceladus, less deep than the wall on Europa. Enceladus is quite a bit smaller. Uh, but again, it could be an environment that could sustain life. Now, we are so concerned about water and a bit biased about it because all life on Earth, of course, needs liquid water, and everywhere on Earth where there is liquid water, there's life in it. So there's a one-to-one -one connection on Earth between life and, and liquid water. So this whole strategy to look for life and to focus on liquid water environments is, of course, based on our experience. But of course, we should, we should jot that down as a sort of a going in bias, of course, in our research. Now, I'm just showing this view because this is going to happen in about, in about 5 a.m. tonight. Actually, 4.53, I think. A CD spacecraft will be plunging into the atmosphere of Saturn. And the reason why it's doing this kamikaze maneuver is because, which it won't survive, of course, uh, is because you do not want to contaminate the Saturn system with the radio isotopic generators, the nuclear reactors that are powering Cassini spacecraft. Okay, so we don't want that to hit one of the moons. We don't want that to somehow hit a ring particle or blew up. It will be environmental on Saturn. So instead, we decide to just have it gobbled up by Saturn itself, which is a giant ball of gas. Anyway, uh, it won't be transmitting images by then. It sent its last image uh, way before it entered the atmosphere because you won't be able to capture the image and send it back to the Earth before burning up. Uh, so this is just how we would imagine it's the view over the shoulder of the scene in a few hours. Courtesy mm -hmm. JPL. Yeah, I probably mentioned that. And then there is another concept that governs habitability, or the, whether an environment is suitable for life or not, which is at the galactic scale. We have stars that are evolving throughout the galaxy. The massive stars, when they die, uh, have these catastrophic moments where they eject gigantic bursts of gamma rays. Gamma ray bursts in astronomy are the most powerful single burst of energy events that we know of. Uh, a gamma ray burst is associated with the death of a supernova star uh, will generate within a few hours as much energy as this our sun in its entire lifetime of 10 billion years, in just a matter of a few hours. So these gamma ray bursts, as we understand them, are very directional. They can go up essentially through the poles of the star. And you do not want to be in the beam of the gamma ray burst. And a paper came out just a few months ago that described uh, the deadliness of gamma ray bursts throughout the Earth's history and how gamma ray bursts from stars dying in our galaxy as we're going around the galaxy might have been responsible for some of the mass extinctions. Some of the mass extinctions of, of animal life were due to asteroid impacts. It is now believed that some of them were due to just us being in the wrong place for a long time and gamma ray burst was more or less in our way. No amount of magnetic field 
will do anything to resist the gamma ray burst. Resistance is futile. <laughs> so this is uh, sort of derived from uh, the article that these guys wrote. Uh, and it shows you here the distance from the center of the galaxy. So where you do not want to be is near the center of the galaxy. Because your probability here of survival, the probability of life existing, okay, is very low at the center of the galaxy because these gamma ray bursts are very frequent. Uh, if you're farther out from the center of the galaxy, you have less frequent gamma ray bursts. So the Earth is here, about the nine parsecs, kiloparsecs, in the center of the galaxy. That's about uh, 29 or 30,000 uh, light years. So we're about 30,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. Uh, we are, life has about a 40% probability of existing on our planet, given how close we are to the center of our galaxy. So, according to this model and, and message, we consider ourselves lucky to be around. Uh, although we might allow our existence precisely due to previous extinctions, and, of course, the other message is we are not shielded from the next gamma ray burst that we might be able to run into. And so beyond this surf or asteroids that could hit us, we should be mindful of the next <laughs> nearby supernova. <laughs> okay. So, what's the number of suitable environments that are suitable for life in a planet system? Well, in our world, we just counted possibly up to 10. You add up the underground on Mars, the fact that Mars even has some water at the near surface, Jupiter, its moons, Saturn, its moons, going even all the way to Uranus, uh, you might actually have up to 10 sustainable environment, environments that are able to sustain life in our own solar system. Uh, but what's the average number? And so I'm going to submit to you that let's call it one. If you have a planetary system, There'll be one body in there, on average, that has an environment that could sustain life. In other words, where the water can be stable. Uh, so far, it's more or less been the case. It might be a little less than one, maybe 0.5 on every other star. But one is not a huge stretch given, I think, what we know about in our own species. Now, being able to sustain life does not mean that there is life on it. it just means that it's a place where you have to look water that's stable for a substantial amount of time. What fraction of those planets would actually see life evolve? Well, how does life start? This goes back to early studies in the 50s by Stanley Miller and Aaron Deering. Uh, they did this memorable experiment where they <coughs> put in a glass jar some gases that are were believed to exist in the early period of the atmosphere of the Earth. We now think it was mostly CO2, but they put some organics, methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen, and then they zap these gases with electrodes delivering about 10,000 volts to so light lightning on the early, in the early Earth's atmosphere. And then, meanwhile, they're avoiding water that circulates so that it rains through these gases, uh, picks up the chemicals cools off and then precipitates the chemicals in this track and then you can analyze the chemicals. So when you do that, you'd be surprised the chemicals are not just methane, ammonia, water, and nitrogen anymore. In fact, those are gone. Those are very volatile the gases. What you end up at the bottom here is complex organic compounds, amino acids, okay, um, which are the building blocks of proteins, strands of broken proteins, uh, it's amazing the complexity that you can find from a relatively straightforward you know, sort of Frankenstein experiment like this. <laughs> so, the Howell Urey Miller experiment proved that you could make complex organic molecules uh, from a relatively simple assumption of what the early Earth's atmosphere was like, with lightning going on. And, and what happens to the chemicals next, of course, is a big mystery because how does that then turn into life? So this part was figured out in the 50s. This uh, is pretty much where we are now. We are able to use the organics from these experiments to start assembling strands of RNAs, ribonucleic acid. It's not quite DNA yet, it's sort of things that have that kind of structure, but they're not living uh, cells yet, of course, they're just 
more complex building blocks of life. And the big problem is sort of to go from here to something that would become a membrane enclosed a cellular entity, let alone something that would start reproducing itself uh, through genetics, let alone something that uh, you know, would become a closer to what we call a modern cell or something, etc. So, so somehow we are able to produce in the lab the very early steps of creating complex organic chemistry, but not to the point where we can actually generate life yet. And so uh, maybe what this tells you is that we don't have in the lab an environment that has enough opportunity for the chemistry to take place. Maybe it needs an environment that's more vast so that you have more chances for chemical reaction to take place. Uh, maybe you cannot do this in a jar in a lab and you need an ocean for that. And so currently the thinking is that life on Earth started in the oceans, uh, most likely. Maybe from collecting uh, organic rich rain uh, made in the atmosphere of the Earth and lightning. And these organic have settled in the bottom of the ocean. Combined with the presence of a heat source, like hydrothermal vents, uh, you might have had an environment that has organic compounds, nutrients, which is available at least at some point to use, uh, energy with the warmth of uh, these hydrothermal vents, and an environment that is environmentally stable, where you are shielded a bit from what's going on in the atmosphere, meteorite impacts. Such, uh, you are a relatively cozy uh, submarine environment. So maybe that's what it took for life to, to get a hold, um, to get going. This is pure speculation. We do not know how life started in the Earth yet. What we do know, though, is that if you look at the oldest rocks that we still have on record on the Earth, there are signatures of life in it. The oldest sedimentary rocks, in other words, when you, the Earth formed, we know, roughly four and a half billion years ago, we do not have rocks from Earth that are that old anymore, because the Earth is a dynamic planet, continents shift, mountains are built, rocks get crushed and melted. So we do not have on Earth rocks that are of the Earth that are four and a half billion years old, but we have meteorites that are plateauing at that age, so we know that's the age of the Earth, that's the age of the solar system. Uh, we do have rocks on Earth that are about 3.9 to 4 billion years old in age, a little older. And those rocks, whenever they are the rocks that were formed in a water-rich environment, contain already signs of life. So the oldest signs of life at this point is still a bit being argued, but anywhere from 3.8 to 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, and again, uh, the message here is that. In the earliest rocks on Earth, we could have had an organic signature be retained, it is found. So, <clears throat> here's the interesting message. If you look at a column of time showing you the age of the Earth, where it formed, the oldest Earth rocks now, which are about 4 billion years old, you will find the earliest record of life pretty much in the oldest rocks that are, that are left from that era. And for the longest while, Earth was only in the oceans and in microbial form throughout the Cambrian. This is all microbes, 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 even though they're multicellular. And then eventually we started having little critters. And then there was the Cambrian explosion, which was not an actual explosion, it was just a big diversification of life, still in water. Uh, and then eventually life conquered land. Uh, and then you are here at the very end. So, the point though is that throughout the Earth's history, life appeared pretty much very early. As soon as conditions allowed liquid water, it seems, to be stable at the surface of the Earth. And so what this uh, tends to tell me, and in fact just me by the number of my colleagues and other researchers, is that uh, if you just look at the one example that we have, you know, we know of, which is the Earth, that's both the caveat, both a a blessing and a curse. Uh, we do have an example of a planet where life uh, started. Uh, well, in the case of this one example, life appeared on it very early. It looks like it was easy, and therefore the suggestion is that microbial worlds could be common. Uh, 
this is not, this is a question mark, this is not a hard, fast rule, okay? But what this is telling you is that if, if on our planet, if we're looking at life, microbial life seems to have appeared so early in Earth's history, it doesn't look like it was something that was going very hard. It also persisted for a very long time. There was no interruption in microbial life okay, throughout Earth's history. Microbes have been very resilient against impacts, plate tectonics, volcanic eruptions. Some of the earliest forms of microbes that appear are still in existence on Earth today. Cyanobacteria, for example, which are microbes that photosynthesize and use sunlight as, as nutrients, okay, uh, are still around today with the same design. And so, microbial life, as far as the Earth can suggest, seems to be something that would be common on many worlds as soon as conditions to sustain life are available. So, I would submit to you that F sub L, it might not be one because that would be claiming that every planet where there are conditions that are suitable for life, life will appear on it. This would suggest that it never appears even when the conditions are right. So that, of course, is not a correct number. Uh, F sub L is somewhere in there. I'm going to suggest to you that it's 0.5. This is both optimistic, it's also based on the single example that we have, the Earth, but at the same time, uh, the Earth is data, and so let's use it. This is a particularly interesting form of life that I wanted to point out, but I'm going to maybe skip over this. No, actually, I should mention that. This is Dinococcus radiodurans. It's uh, actually a unicellular microorganism, but it has walls within its cell and four sets of DNA. Hmm. It's the only microbe in nature that we know of that has that. <laughs> And it has four sets of DNA, which makes it particularly resistant to radiation damage. Hence its name, the Anacarcus, which just means bacteria, essentially. Radio durans means endures radiation. So the Anacarcus radiodurans is very well adapted to survive radiation, because if radiation damages one DNA, that's okay, all three chime in with original copies and they ensure that the fourth copy is replicated properly. An amazing adaptation, we do not understand why it has that. People have speculated that it's actually inherited from being a space-born microbe that could travel through space. It certainly is well equipped to survive uh, space journeys, although they're not unprotected. It's not very good under zero, under vacuum. There are other forms of microbes that are very good actually surviving under vacuum, but do not have the four sets of DNA. So, uh, anyway, part of the mysteries of early life. What fraction of life, once it appears, evolves into intelligence? And let's define intelligence here. It can be arbitrary. You could choose the beaver as being the intelligence. And all that means is that, well, to get from there to a civilization, uh, it will take just more time. So F sub i, depending on, it doesn't matter how you define intelligence, because what matters in the end is F sub i and F sub c. Okay. So in other words, if you choose intelligence to be something that's earlier, that's okay. It just makes becoming an advanced civilization a little more difficult. If you choose it to be later, that's okay. It makes becoming an intelligent civilization faster and smoother. So they compensate each other. So in this case, we're going to say, We've become intelligent, life has become intelligent on Earth about a million years ago when Homo erectus uh, came onto the scene, capable of throwing stones, sharpening tools, and making fire. This, this is a candid moment <laughs> in the life of Mr. and Mrs. Homo erectus. <laughs> This is on the right. <laughs> okay, so what does that tell us? Well, human life took a long, long while, and only records that is intelligent life, if you define intelligence as that, took a long, long while to appear. After the Cambrian, this is now the top part of the previous scale bar that I showed you. Okay, we're now looking at the late, latest 600 million years, before it used to go all the way to 4.6 billion, now it's the last 600 million years. 
Cambrian explosion happens, the first fish appear, the first land plants. Nothing was on land until about 450 billion years ago, billion years ago. First amphibians, first reptiles, first dinosaurs, birds, mammals. Mammals and dinosaurs ruled the earth for about 200 million years. And then the KT boundary event, which marked the end of the dinosaurs, probably the modern impact. And then eventually, several 65 million years ago, or 64 technically, and then until about a million years ago, Homo erectus appears. So what this picture tells you is that for most of life's history on Earth, uh, it was not intelligent. It had not come up with anything that would create technology like sharpening tools, making fire, uh, to the point where it could really change and control its environment. So, meanwhile, you should witness some mountain, mountain building events, the Appalachians, uh, the Rockies, the Himalayas, right? India uh, ran into Pakistan, okay, something like 50 million years ago. So, the conflict goes back a long way. <laughs> <laughs> What does this mean? Well, intelligent life appeared late on Earth. Unlike microbial life that showed up very early, intelligent life, Homo erectus, took pretty much 4.6 billion years, minus a million years, to, to show up. And so, what does this tell you? Well, that tells me, I don't know about you, and again, granted, this is the one example that we have. We only have the Earth as an example, but it's a data point. Uh, what this tells me is that if the Earth is an example that can be generalized. You know, if this is a pattern that's on other planets where intelligence eventually emerges, which is something that emerges late, in spite of the early start of life itself, well then F sub i is likely to be a very small number. How small? Well, it's hard to quantify. One way to estimate it is to suggest that it's the duration of the presence of humans versus the age of the Earth. That gives you a rough sense of how rare it is. In other words, it's the last million years divided by the 4.6 billion years of Earth's history. Now, it's not how you would want to uh, quantify the fraction of life that falls into intelligent life, but it's one way of getting a sense of its rarity. And what this means here is if you if you were to Take any million year randomly in the entire history of the Earth, okay, the chances of finding intelligent life on it, in other words, anything that has only rectus or better or more involved on it, is 0 0.0002. Two ten thousandths is, is the fraction, is your probability in that sense. And so, for lack of a better way of really quantifying properly how rare intelligent life is, uh, this fraction of time during which intelligent life was on Earth compared to the age of the Earth is what we're using as a proxy. And so that number is two ten thousandths. It's not zero, but it's a small number, it's going to bring everybody down into the bunker of the great equation. <laughs> because once intelligence appears, well, it took about a million years to go from Homo erectus to an intelligent civilization. And by an intelligent civilization, a civilization that's able to communicate, an uh, advanced civilization that is, that's able to communicate using radio signals, is a civilization that understands Maxwell's equations. Maxwell was a great British physicist. He came up with the laws of electromagnetic radiation. E is the electric field, B is the magnetic field. These four equations are not easy to understand. I discover things about them every day. Uh, but you, uh, to me, Maxwell's work marks our real first understanding of what radio signals are, what the nature of light is, and how radio waves can be used to transmit signals. And so it's not the beginning of radio transmissions, that would be about 100 years ago, the work of Janstein. 
Uh, but Maxwell, uh, Maxwell's equation of Marx, essentially the official dominant intelligence of an advanced civilization on our planet. And I'm sure you'd be very proud about that. So, this is Homo erectus. In fact, a specific example, uh, Sankiran 17 from Java, who's about a million years old. And James Clerk Maxwell. Okay, so it took about one million years to go from a bad haircut to another bad haircut. <laughs> All right. Now, even when intelligence appears, it's not necessarily the case, even though on Earth it took about a million years to go from just being intelligent to being an advanced civilization capable of interstellar communication. The appearance of intelligence doesn't necessarily lead to this final step. You can imagine a society of beings or animals that could be very intelligent, like cetaceans on the Earth, but they are in an environment that is just not encouraging them to, to see beyond because, to, to look beyond because they can't see beyond. Uh, so, uh, you know, orcas, for example, are social animals, they have language, they communicate, they are extremely smart, they seem to be smarter than most of the domestic animals we have around us. Uh, and nevertheless, they don't have astronomy, because they didn't see the night sky, uh, but not often enough. Uh, they you don't have the means to really uh, use technology, to create technology to alter their environment. And so, you can imagine intelligence sort of dead-ending on some planets because somehow they don't have access to information about the outside world and the ability to really transform it. Uh, you could also imagine intelligent creatures that are on, at the surface, um, like ourselves maybe, but under a permanent cloud cover where you would never get the sense that there's even astronomy or that there's a universe beyond the clouds. And with that delay or postponed perpetuity, your ability to ever communicate as a, as a as communicating society. So, for this reason, F sub C is not 1, it's definitely not 0, but it might be 0.1 which means that intelligent civilization on Earth appeared immediately, but then the caveat is that you could have a lot of dead ends to intelligent life. So, had there not been these dead ends, I might have said F sub C is maybe 0.5, uh, just to avoid saying that it's automatically 1, but with this caveat, I think we should reduce the number of F sub C to about 0.1. So, as you can see, a lot of this involves, you know, judgment calls, senses of what might be general or not. It's, it's not an exact science, it's speculative, but at the same time, that's the nature of this kind of research. What about the longevity of a civilization? People have wild claims about this. You know, a million years. We have no example of any society on Earth that has survived a million years. We are no longer Homo erectus, or Homo erecti. Uh, this, however, is the Nile Valley seen from the space station. Uh, so Nile Delta, that's the Mediterranean, and the Sinai Peninsula at night. And so you can still see that our modern civilization has built on the geographic and sort of uh, culture of ancient civilization. So one might argue that okay, this is still the persistence of ancient Egypt into modern days. Okay, this is maybe a 10,000 year old class civilization that we got. But not quite. 3,000, what is 3,000? It's minus 5 to, to about the 2, you know, 7,000 year old civilization. Uh, but the truth is, no real civilization on Earth, defined in the classical sense, but its culture, has really survived more than uh, 500 to uh, 1,000 years or so. Beyond that, you know, upheaval, revolution, societal changes, invasions, uh, things happen. There are other things that threaten the longevity of a society. We are exposed to meteorite impacts from asteroids and comets. This is the out and impact crater on Devon Island, where I go every summer to, this is one of the most Mars-like places on Earth. It's a crater, an impact crater that's 20 kilometers across, and formed 23 million years ago, uh, when an asteroid or a comet, we're not sure, was about half a mile in size, slammed into the Earth. And it just did 
tremendous regional damage and didn't reset the course of life on Earth, but it was up there in terms of uh, being a significant event, at least regionally. It wiped out life several hundred kilometers around, and uh, it would have made the evening news. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were subject to an impact like this, uh, you know, if it's in the wrong place, it could annihilate a huge chunk of human society and intelligence. And let's say Silicon Valley uh, disappeared under a large impact. Well, the release of the iPhone would have to be postponed. <laughs> it would impact our society. Another threat to our longevity is population growth. Of course, to contrast it with need for resources. So this is showing population growth versus the year all the way up to the year 2100. This is UN data, so they have a high estimate for the red for what the population might do. It sort of shoots up exponentially as it abates. Uh, in yellow, you have the UN media model where eventually it comes to our senses and there's protection. Um, and then there's the green model where we actually have drastic measures to reduce human population at a sort of the curve that's considered to be plausible. This is where we are right now, but the future is not clear because it depends on policy, and policy usually doesn't go beyond next week. <laughs> of course, we also have pandemics that can wipe out uh, human civilization. I don't need to explain this. Uh, and then world wars, finally, and we're not completely safe from those yet, either. So, this is something we need to consider and, and very much. So, the number of factors, especially when we become a capable civilization technologically, the number of ways you could annihilate yourself, in fact, you're less dangerous and more primitive uh, to your long-term survival than when you are actually uh, very capable like we are. So, what's the longevity of a civilization? Well, Historically, cultures have lasted anywhere from 500 to about 5,000 years. Really, it's hard to make the case that we lasted longer. We're now global, we have, we're high tech, and we can self annihilate globally. So, uh, but let's be optimistic. Let's say that the longevity of a civilization that's technically advanced is 10,000 years. I mean, you could say a million, if you have no data for that, you could say 100,000. There's no data for that. There's no data for 10,000 either, but at least it's somewhat commensurate with what we had before and shows a little touch of optimism um, in that sense. It's what we've survived so far if you include, you know, ancient Egypt and Babylon as our, as our family. So, where does that leave us? Well, plug in the numbers 20 times 0.5 times 1. Times 0.5 times 0.0002 times 0.1 times 10,000, you get one. <laughs> not 10,000, not 100, you get one. It's probably not us. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually a key question. Let's say it is one. Well, it's either us, but since it's not very precise, it could be us and someone else out there. There's someone else out there in the galaxy, galaxy being about 100,000 light years across, chances are they are. Give or take 50,000 light years away, you would set a signal now, and get it 50,000 light years from now. By then, you moved on. Remember also, our longevity is on 10,000 years, so our signal becomes moot because there's no sender anymore 10,000 years from now. Um, yeah. Uh, I read about something in the news that scientists are excited about these fast radio folks that are coming from deep space. Yeah, so those were the gamma rays we actually talked about earlier. Uh, they're excited by them in a sort of uh, scary sense. Yeah, yeah. I saw articles like they need to be extraterrestrial or life and they can't be with us. Oh, that, that's a theory, but that's. I mean, the, the amounts of energies that are involved are so astounding. And then it's, it sounds like it's not really a good way to do it. We actually have the potential of wiping out life. 
Because the signals only travel faster. Let, let's say you, you have enough power in the gamma ray burst to communicate from one galaxy to the next. Most of the gamma ray bursts we see and are aware of have never occurred in our Milky Way. That's because the, it's believed that gamma ray bursts and supernova explosions happen maybe you know, there's, there's a few per million years. So we just haven't spotted one yet in our own galaxy. Gamma ray but we see plenty coming from other galaxies. And they're so powerful that we, they stand out against the background of an entire swarm of stars in those galaxies. And then they only last a few hours at most. Uh, there are remnants and x ray for days, but basically they, they look really like catastrophic events that affect stars as opposed to being the human messages we send to anybody. Yeah. We, we don't have the question answer part yet, but go ahead. Could you go on to the question of that though? Um, eventually, the last thing is life. It got generated on Earth simultaneously in a lot of different places. It seems to me that it would be for echo and fire. But if life generated in one instance, one place, and all of that, you know, tickets, it's from there, wouldn't it be a lot harder for echo to be given in the Yeah, you, you could make the case that there are separate genesis events on Earth alone. Yeah, that, that makes the emergence of life even more easy. But first of all, that's hard to discriminate, and second, there's no evidence in our record right now that there are somehow there were two gen Genesis events. So you don't, you don't have any evidence of that. You don't have any evidence of that. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but if it did happen, it seems like we really you know, work things out since. Okay, so 50,000 light years is, is the episode. Let's think about some of the consequences. Let's say this is actually correct. First of all, case number one, we're alone. We're alone. We can't prove it, we don't know it, but let's say we are alone. No amount of SETI columns is going to ever get us a signal for listening to our own galaxy. Listen to other galaxies much farther, our chances are much better because the chances are better, but there are issues. Uh, because there's a hundred billion other galaxies out there. And even if each galaxy only had one civilization on it, well, you know, that civilization making our ruckus, then we might be able to hear it. Of course, it's been meaning, meaningless to actually hear it, because by the time you hear it, you're going to realize you're hearing a signal that was generated at best, it came from Andromeda 2 million years ago, at worst, on the other end of the universe, 15 or 13 million years ago. So where does that leave you, you know, in terms of, this is not communication, this is just detection. <laughs> uh, so, so, but let's explore this idea a little further. Um, we listen, we don't hear anything. Uh, it still doesn't prove that we're alone. That's the other issue. Being alone is a very hard thing to prove. Because again, you have to somehow do an exhaustive search of every corner of the galaxy if we can establish that somehow we only tell the society. But if it were true, this would mean that we would never hear a signal. Uh, not even by changing techniques to optical setting. Uh, if we focus only on all the apps. And it also means that uh, at this time we are the only civilization. Uh, but in our statistics to get to this number, we are expected to last only about 10,000 years. And then life on another planet could then become more of a intelligence emerge on it become a communicating civilization, but that would last also a whole time. So this concept means that it's not just us forever in our galaxy, it means us for maybe you know, 10,000 years, it's hypothesized here, and then it's somebody else's turn for about 10,000 years. There's no overlap uh, in, this, in this scenario, and so if you look at the galaxy, a nuclear galaxy from far away, it's like a Christmas tree where the lights represent civilizations that live and die, but no light turns on quite at the same time. They sort of are dispersed across the galaxy and we have no memory or knowledge of each other. Uh, but while we're here, and let's say we do live only 10,000 years, we have an incredible window. We have ways to maybe ensure that we live longer as a society. Maybe we can become a multi-planet species, but not just within our solar system. Within several star systems, uh, 
this, from my perspective, is, is both a daunting possibility, but also sort of an invitation to really get creative, to, to become more stellar, to have the ability to travel, to expand, to gain a foothold on other planets, uh, to to beat the clock, to not live just 10,000 years, but, but uh, beat the odds as well. And if we're able to actually show that, hey, society and powers be as technically capable as we are, or more, can actually live about 10,000 years, but 100,000, maybe even a million, well, that would be an incredible thing. By then, I think we'll see other examples of, of life, intelligent life, even in our own yards, we ourselves spreading across the yards. So, uh, you know, to, to me, this, uh, this this notion that, first of all, that I grew up with, the galaxy is so full of life and different societies, it's sort of a nice romantic, you know, Star Trek in and Star Wars in view, but it's not really born by evidence. We got to this end number by being relatively conservative, by using the Earth as an example when it was the only example available. Sure, it's a big stretch to say that's you can generalize that, the things from, from the one Earth example, but nevertheless, it's data. Uh, if, you, if you come up with other stuff, it's just be more speculative. And, and so, you know, it's... Uh, and approximately equals one, in this case, is not even the most probable answer, because we don't know what the probabilities are. We don't know the Earth is represented. If the Earth is an exception, in its behavior, and even though this is based on an existing rational data point, it still would not be representative of reality. And so, as long as we don't know if the Earth is exceptional or not, we won't know whether this is really likely to be true or not. But for now, it's what our data points to. It's the hypothesis, in my view, to beat. Uh, it should not deter us from actually listening for signals, because we could be way off. Uh, but at the same time, we should also understand why, uh, we also understand possibly why there's nobody out there uh, in appearance. So we could be if there's another society, they would be 50,000 light years away. Again, I said this, it would be very hard to communicate with them, unless we were somehow really lucky to live in store. One of the odds of that is very small. Uh, so this should force us to be, uh, even though we're unique in this scenario, it's very important to understand that we're unique not because we're special, or because we somehow are here by divine intervention or anything. It has nothing to do with this, right? We would be unique just because intelligent life is a rare outcome in, in our hypothesis here in this chain of events. And so, yes, we would be special, We'd be different, uh, we'd be unique, that's great, but it doesn't mean that the universe is made for us, the galaxy will have to concur. Okay. I think what it means is that we should be really responsive. Nobody's going to be out there coming to help us in the day. We're not going to be admitted at some point into some galactic club. <laughs> you know, we have reached maturity. Uh, we could be really well on our own. This is our planet. As long as we have the means to go elsewhere, we should really take care of it. So to me, this, this possibility that n equals 1 is really a, uh, a wake-up call in some sense. It's a call for us to be extremely responsible, more so than we might otherwise be, for our planet and our future. Uh, we should really um, you know, reflect on the fact that uh, this for now is all we have, and again, we Nobody out, out there to help us. We have to be very self-reliant. We, we have to um, be mindful that there's no room for error. That's the thing. You know, if you have further thoughts on this, I welcome them. And again, do not walk away with this as being anything certain. It's just what a reasonable set of arguments with the existing data seems to point to for now as a, as a working hypothesis. All right. Yep. Um, thanks for putting this uh, slide back up because uh, 
Uh, basically, this takes us to an answer of n equals 1 for an intelligent device. Because it seems to me you can also adjust your the last few uh, factors uh, in order to get uh, how frequently you find the most primitive microbial life, uh, multicellular primitive life, uh, mammals that are not very bright, uh, that kind of thing. Have you given any thought to that? Yeah, so you can assume that, let's say that the Earth's not only the Earth's history, but the whole evolutionary path and the state of the Earth's Earth life went through was somehow a pattern that we could produce in one world. Well, microbial worlds would essentially be everywhere where there is liquid water. There's microbial life starts very soon. There could be microbial worlds or alien worlds in our own solar system, since N might N sub E might be more than one in our solar system. Uh, there could be I actually worked out the numbers. You see, again, it goes back to dividing the duration of these life forms have persisted on the Earth versus the age of the Earth. So, if you look at dinosaurs that went here not one million years like Homo sapiens have, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens have been, but 200 million years, well, you have that many more chances of finding worlds that have dinosaur style life you know, potentially in the galaxy. And, and so, there's plenty of life in the galaxy. That's the thing. Even there could be microbial worlds in our solar system. There could be animal life a few light years out. There could be, you know, dinosaurs, birds, or beasts roaming, you know, higher or lower gravity worlds for us to explore. There could be oxygen-rich planets and plant life, plants that you know can you ever imagine. There could be a wild jungle out there. Uh, but things that are building radio telescopes, understand Maxwell's equations. Um, the barbershops and the civilized, it's, it's, it's really, it's really rare. Um, the, the, the purpose of SETI that was created to look for life. And so I'm just curious about why you work there. What she means is why were you not running run out of town by an angry mom and live by your father? <laughs> I, I grew up uh, dreaming and thinking about the Drake Equation. Uh, I mean, uh, I actually, but I'd like to explain this because it's sort of part of the context. And so, to me, the Drake Equation has been a very powerful guide in my thinking and sort of understanding of, of what we know about space and astronomy and the universe and our galaxy in particular. Um, I was called Satan's last TA. And you know, Carl actually believed that uh, the basic equation yielded the numbers that are of order 10,000. Okay? Maybe 1,000 to 10,000. He was not so much an optimist, he was actually a very rigorous thinker. But at the time, there were some major unknowns about the fraction of, uh, well, some, some of these factors. And so, you know, there was a little more wiggle room even than now. Uh, and so he had, he had this perspective that there, there might be many uh, civilizations out there. So, so I joined the SETI Institute something like 20 years ago, and at the time, uh, well, first of all, the SETI Institute, you should understand, doesn't just do SETI. It doesn't just do the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, it's one of the things it does. Uh, it's the first thing that it did. But nowadays, the SETI Institute is a large organization that does research on the possibilities of life in the universe in general, how life started. How it can expand into space, so human, human space travel is my study of the same institute. Uh, how life gets established, how it's external, ex becomes extinct, uh, how you find it in extreme environments, what kinds of adaptations exist. Even microbial life is part of what the SETI Institute is interested in. So I'm in heaven uh, by remaining at the SETI Institute. <laughs> But they took away your parking space, right? <laughs> it's a great parking space. So this reminds me of this cartoon that shows the SETI Institute and the parking lot, and then there's this big circle for uh, you know, alien visitors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, so I would just say that I don't like the use of this formulation of the Bragg's equation. You started out talking about how many stars there are and everything. And he basically threw away that number and put it at rate constant. So I would suggest switching to the form of the Drake equation that has the number of stars in it. So at least that big number shows up, and then you've got this intuitive connection between the regional. You find that more, more satisfying to have. Much, much more yeah. satisfying. But then, you know, 
Carl, I think Carl actually, Carl Sagan, I did that in his book Cosmos. Mm -hmm. um, he actually we we revise this equation and turn into something that's more intuitively connected with the number of stars in the galaxy. But the one other thing I but it, it comes to the same mathematically. It's a thing. It I know. The same. I know. But I get it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. And the, and the one number there is that f sub i is point zero 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 two. I mean, there's a lot of wiggle room in that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, on point. Well, the numbers here are color coded. The color coding means that these numbers could be off by one order of magnitude if they're white, two orders of magnitude if they're yellow, three orders of magnitude. That means a thousand times off if they're orange, and ten thousand times or more off. In other words, we have no grasp on it. So the color coding <laughs> right here just tells you that in the Drake equation right now, we have some vague confidence in these two numbers. This one is coming into focus with Kepler and all the latest discoveries in planets. But all of these are still everybody's wild guess. I tried to come up with numbers that were based on the if you, if, well, on the one example we have, which is the Earth. Okay. Well, that's it. Yeah. I think I could make an argument based on your starting data for an F line of about 25, even given that the longevity of life getting to be intelligent is billions of years, and then it's only been a million years since then. Supposing that you say that the habitable lifespan of our solar system is about 10 billion years until the sun swallows us up, and it took about half of that to get to intelligent life. And then intelligent life then takes a million years to become civilized and 10,000 years to kill itself. Right. That would mean that even if the probability of Fi was 1, or 0.5, that any instance of an intelligent civilization would be given the lecture hall and say, well, it took 3 billion or 7 billion or however many billion years to become intelligent, and then 1, billion, 1 million years after that to get into this lecture room, and then we're all dead. <laughs> but, so given the data of billions of years to become intelligent, and then a million years to become civilized and kill yourselves, you can still have a value of that line equals 0.5 that fits that data. I think what you're saying is, let's say this talk we're not given now, but some of the hundreds of whatever, let's say 100 million years later, and that we have been around for that much longer. You could argue that this would allow more, in other words, intelligence would have been around for us. A greater fraction of the Earth's history than it has been so far. Well, I'm not arguing for that at all. Okay. I'm saying, I'm that, would, that would bump up that, and survive. I'm making an argument that intelligence appears randomly, sometime during the 10 billion year lifespan of the habitability of the solar system. It appears and goes boom, which is what you want to do when you have steam or hell. You can still support a value of FI. And then you're going to point five that exactly fits your assumptions. So I'm challenging Good. your point a little bit too. And again, I, I, the talk is simplified in the sense that the error bar is in the way. There's a three orders of magnitude range of possibilities here that's, that would cover the point five option. I'm just saying that my point five seems to be more plausible than your point five. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to your question. See you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make the same point and just uh, underscore that it seems like what you're doing as a survival also sort of um, conflicts with L um, because you're you're rolling in L into that survival. Because from the observer guys. Is from the sort of probably principle right, idea that, well, of course, we would only be able to measure you know, a million years of human history because we're at the end of that uh, pre technological 
And you, you couldn't you couldn't have measured it before you couldn't have measured it after that. Um, the thing that, that really kicks me up at night is that so now um, because the what we know the needs to down of, of all of this is the by presence and nobody has uh, has put together a convincing uh, even uh, technical argument about how to get from those amino acids into uh, the, the, the prebiotic, uh, precellular uh, structures to, to living cells. Uh, so where's the best research on those kinds of mechanisms and, 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 and how long is it going to be before we get an end So I brought up the state of research in terms of uh, starting life from chemistry, just to bring that up as being part of the thinking that you could actually conceivably still create life in the dark, in the sense that you don't expect life to appear in the dark, but there's still a lot of active work that's being done in, in uh, prebiotic chemistry that allows you to create some very promising compounds that are fundamental to the complex life by body. So, so I just wanted to bring that up. The number, however, that was used for F sub L uh, does not rest on that research. And part of that research was brought up as being part of the context of you know, our need to understand more about your life. Uh, the F sub L was just brought, the number here just reflects the quick emergence of microbial life on Earth uh, when you look at the, the history that's recorded earlier. Microbes again just seem to have appeared very quickly and, and easily. But that's the same with logical fallacy as how, how, how short it's been since, uh, since the emergence of, of, of our species. Um, you're, you're including the time elements, um, but the time elements are taken, taken care of with the So. So using using the time element as a as a proxy for probability it is a, it, it's questionable. So, so is there a blog that talks about all this stuff? So, 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 so. No, I mean I just see a point. The, the issue here is that you can one cannot be one should not be fixated on any one of these things. Okay. Again, because there are it's recognized Quite illustrating, just the color code here will get appealing. Uh, it should be recognized that, that there are major unknowns behind each one of these terms that are in the orange and here, especially in red. Again, three orders of magnitude. So, in other words, your the whole discussion would be completely swayed if, for example, this was allowed to be four orders of magnitude greater. Uh, same with with uh, F sub i. F sub i, if uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I'm comfortable with the way the logic was was put together. I, mean, it's, I, I find it to be internally consistent. I don't quite see the, the inconsistency that you're pointing out because this is about sort of the future, whereas this is about what has happened so far. So the, to me, that there's no there's no overlap with your with your First of all, you're off by orders of magnitude right there already. I think I think you're about right. I would just flip it. Uh, <laughs> flip Ellen. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a longer discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe a couple more. So um, you know, I think your point about the big two chair of ours is really important because I think the best question we have in science is I don't know. Yeah. Right? And that's not a comfortable answer. <laughs> But it's the beginning of a great dis sense of discovery in science. And for a lot of the things we're looking at here, a great example is what's being done with Kepler. In the last 10 years, we've learned tremendous things. We're just getting started. For abiogenesis, that's my biggest question of this thing. Um, like, we just don't have a clue, right? You make, I understand why you make assumptions. It kind of doesn't matter. Um, the, the overall answer to the drinking question today is, I don't know. And in our lifetimes, we might actually be able to fill 
many more of these in. And that's exciting. Uh, the, 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 mess, the takeaway message really is, is, is well, that's one of them. That's a really good one. Uh, the, the other one is, is, is just to bring up the, the contrast between what is a possibility as well versus what is the common assumption. The common assumption is that there are, there are many out there that are justifying this or that you know, J effort. And meanwhile, to me, this has the effect of not being significantly more accurate. It's not significantly more accurate. Uh, but it's nevertheless a sobering perspective because it's like a bucket of cold water to, to, to chill the passion. <laughs> and it's not to be an naysayer or negative about it, it's just to, you know, rock with the perspective. That's, that's, that's the goal. Or to send it to the White House. Say again? Send it to the White House. It's a long time to One last question. It's hard to summarize in a tweet. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment. There's a couple of you that have been skeptical about research in abiogenesis, and I, I don't know how knowledgeable this crowd is or what, but uh, there's quite a lot of work that's going on in that uh, in the area of uh, 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 what we call white smokers in the ocean. And GPL's uh, doing a lot of research in that area, and there are several other folks uh, that are doing the same. But essentially, their, their premise is that I need a bag to hold everything, I need a Krebs cycle uh, to make my energy, and I need a blueprint in the form of DNA or something to be able to replicate the whole mess. And essentially, they're theoretically, they're, they're showing how inside various cells, inside these uh, 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 alkaline smokers, uh, that you can actually uh, make uh, little uh, uh, abiogenetic uh, life forms. And I, I think that uh, when, when that first happened, things, uh, the circumstances on Earth were quite a bit different than they are today. So therefore, trying to recreate the past when you can't see it is particularly hard. It's onerous. But uh, nevertheless, I, I think within 10 or 20 years, somebody's actually going to make a one-celled animal in a an laboratory. Mm -hmm. Great vendor's jar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Saving a, a few claps for yourself, for various subjects, for Wonderfest, and for the Robiata. Please give many big claps for Dr. Wilson. <laughs>